Good morning, church. Our reading today is 2 Timothy chapter 4. In the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead in view of his appearing and his kingdom? I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved the world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke with his, is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me and the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the house of Onesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. Eubulus greet you, and so do Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Well, praise be to God for his mighty word. And uh, thank you, Jenny, for reading that. One advantage of being the little brother to my uh, older sister, I can actually try to get her to slip up over difficult words and difficult names. <laughs> but she spent the whole week practicing this, and uh, she's got every one of those names, I think, perfectly correct. So very well, Jenny, 10 out of 10. <laughs> 10 out of 10. And uh, we are coming now uh, to 2 Timothy, and I've entitled this Paul's Last Words. And uh, we've really been on quite a journey, haven't we, through this uh, little but very powerful book. In fact, every page of the Bible is uh, incredibly powerful. And we've been on this journey, and today we come to the last chapter and the conclusion of the series. Hallelujah. Amen. 
And I do hope that you've been studying this book for yourselves, and I do hope that you've got a lot out of it. And I suppose one of the uh, jobs of a preacher, of a pastor, is to try to correctly divide the word of God, as Paul has said, into Timothy, and to bring a challenge to the church, and uh, to uh, bring, hopefully, the truths of the Bible to the church, at least for you to be pondering, to really thinking about, and to check stuff out for yourselves. You know that I always say it is a good thing to check everything out for yourselves because there is no one who stands on a platform who is going to be 100% correct 100% of the time. Amen. Only the Lord Jesus Christ was 100% correct and 100% correct all of the time in all of eternity. But I do hope you've got a lot out of uh, 2 Timothy. Uh, it has certainly been a very challenging book. It's certainly been a big challenge to me. And I'm sure even the summary and the conclusion will bring challenges to us today, certainly to think about. We know that Paul is the author. He is writing to his partner in the gospel, to Timothy. Timothy is his understudy. Paul has been mentoring him and helping Timothy to grow. Uh, uh, Timothy is the younger man in years, and uh, he's really learned so much from Paul, who drew alongside him to grow him in strength, and now to commission him and to send him out to continue the work. Paul, uh, in, in this uh, passage, gives a series of encouragements to Timothy, but he also, as you would have picked up, uh, all the way through to Timothy, in fact, so much of, of the Bible, we are warned about the end times, we are warned about things that people bring into churches, we are warned about false doctrines, we are warned about these things. And again, Paul, throughout to Timothy, has said it time and time and time again, and in the last sermon, he said it then, and and actually said it again in, in, in chapter 4. So he really wanted Timothy to be watchful, to be on his guard, to, to know his doctrines, to know his Bible, and to be able to assess the things that were coming into the church. And Paul gives these amazing encouragements to Timothy, and, and hopefully through this book, the encouragements come to us as well. And we know about fanning into the flame the gift that God has put within us. We know about actually fanning into flame as we've actually heard Sue say. She, she had a picture. She, she was engaged with God. She had something on her heart and, and it got fanned into flame and, and, and it burst a light and, and God said, step on that lovely escalator. I will do the work. My burden is light. I will take you where I want you to go. And the proof is in the pudding, isn't it? The proof is in the outworking of the works as to whether we heard God correctly or we didn't. And of course, Sue did because it's a flourishing, uh, a flourishing um, uh, charity doing an amazing work. Do you, does anyone notice as you get older, occasionally a word drops out of your mind? Is it just me? It's a new experience. Church, it's a new experience for me. And uh, I've noticed over a number of weeks that every now and then I'm hunting for the right word. And, uh, uh, but anyway, moving on from that. Paul says to Timothy, fan into flame the gift within you. And of course, Timothy's gift was preaching the gospel. We heard about how to stand firm against pressure and persecution. Be a soldier for the Lord Jesus Christ. Train like an athlete and work hard like a farmer. And Paul warned Timothy that he was living in perilous times and there were perilous men seeking to lead the church astray into false doctrines. Nothing really has changed since the birth of the church. There is an adversary, there is an enemy of the church, and he seeks always to undermine, he seeks always to bring in different gospels, he seeks always to lead people astray. So in a way, nothing has changed. And in fact, the Apostle Paul seems to be indicating, as does the Bible, things will get worse in this area the closer we come to the return of Jesus. We heard about wolves in sheep's clothing, didn't we? And we heard about, as Paul did in uh, chapter 3, men or women who are deceived. They are being deceived and they are deceiving others. There are great warnings in this little book. 
And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things about the Bible is we have to preach the whole counsel of God, even the difficult things that uh, might come up. There are some great passages in this chapter, as there are in every chapter. And I could have just focused on one, one aspect, but I'm going to try to focus on the whole thing today. Paul had ended chapter 3. Paul ended chapter 3 by lifting high the word of God. Hallelujah. And of course, in Paul's time, the, the word of God that they had was the Old Testament. In fact, the New Testament, Paul was writing to Timothy, and it's part of the New Testament was being written. But the New Testament has been completed and finished. It's a complete book. A beginning, a middle, and an end. And it all hangs together. And we had this amazing uh, uh, verse uh, in uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the man and woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do you know, the Word of God is accurate, and I put a plumb line on this picture. The Word of God is the plumb line. It is the standard by which everything else needs to be judged against. And the more we read it, the more we know it, the more we will be able to spot any forgeries. However, I have to say, in these end times, even the Bible is being changed and quite radically. And I've thought long and hard about this over many years, but I feel the time is right to bring a warning about it. And we need to be reading the right Bible, and now we need to check out each new translation that comes to print of the Bible to see the origins of the work. And for me and for many, many other pastors and ministers in the world, a rather disturbing development, the Passion Translation Bible has come to planet Earth, if you like, and it's growing in popularity. And I know that some of you have spoken to me about it. I know some of you, we've had uh, in-depth conversations, but there might be many who don't know much about the origin of this Bible. When there's a new translation, we go to the bookshop, that looks fantastic. We go and we buy it and we read it, and actually we can get an awful lot out of it. Of course we can. We can get an awful lot out of Shakespeare as well. But I want to tell you how this particular translation has come about, and I want to give you a warning about it because there is a lot of controversy over it. Indeed, as I've said, most Christians will not even be aware about what I'm about to say. Paul said to Timothy, be on your guard. Paul said to Timothy, have a mechanism by which you can gauge truth from error. And indeed, I made an error at my own ordination some 28 years ago. Um, I was training for the Church of England. I'd gone to uh, uh, a pretty good Bible, a Bible-believing uh, evangelical Bible college, Wycliffe Hall. And then we were asked, at your ordination, the bishop will come along and, and uh, things are going to be said. You're making a commitment to Jesus and a commitment to the church. And, and the bishop wants to give you a personal Bible. And here's a list of Bibles. Which one do you want? Well, I looked at my bookshelf and I had a lot of different translations of the Bible and I chose the Jerusalem Bible. But I did not know at the time, I was not aware that the Jerusalem Bible is the Roman Catholic Bible. The Jerusalem Bible contains all the other bits and pieces that our Protestant Bible did away with as not being part of the canon of scripture. And here I was being ordained into the Church of England and the bishop says, ah, oh. wondering, has he got sound doctrine? Does this man know what he's doing? And I didn't, I was in ignorance. It is so easy to be in ignorance, isn't it? And uh, when I picked up, because I'm quite a sensitive person, I, I picked up that he had a bit of an issue and, and the people around me, my, my fellow ordinance, there was a gasp. <gasps> we always thought that Chris was funny. 
Yeah, we always thought there was something wrong with him, uh, particularly when he spoke about God speaks through the power of his Holy Spirit. Uh, they did think a few things about me. And here I was being ordained into the Church of England with the Catholic Bible. It's a bit of an oxymoron or a clash of symbols. So we must even check out our Bibles, the ones that we believe have truly come from God. Now, the origins of this Passion uh, Translation, the Passion Bible, it came about in 2015. Brian Simmons is a really nice guy. I've got nothing personal against people at all. But Brian Simmons, he claims to be a modern-day apostle with the same authority as the Apostle Paul and the other apostles in the Bible. So this is where he's coming from, and he wrote the Passion Translation of the Bible. This is controversial in its own right. It absolutely is. And I believe and I would contend and I would put to you, there are no more apostles like the originals in the New Testament. There are no more apostles who have the authority to add to Scripture, to rewrite Scripture. The Bible is a complete and finished work. The Hebrew and the Greek are complete, finished works. Of course, we have to translate the Bible into all of the languages of the world, and of course, there are issues within every single translation. There's probably nothing which is perfect apart from the originals. But there is something specific about the TPT, the Passion Translation of the Bible, I want to tell you about. This is what Brian himself has said about how he received this translation of the Bible. These are his words, easily checked out if you want to. I say check things out, easily checked out if you need to. And this is what he says. Jesus Christ came into my room. He breathed on me and he commissioned me and he spoke to me and said, I am commissioning you to translate the Bible into the translation project that I am giving to you. And Brian goes on to say, and he, Jesus, promised that he would help me. And he promised me that he would give me the secrets of the Hebrew language. He breathed on me so that I would do the project. And I felt downloads coming instantly. I received downloads. It was like I got a chip put inside of me. He goes on to say, I got a connection inside of me to hear him better, to understand the scriptures better, and hopefully to translate. Now, I don't know what you think about these statements. I don't know how you have received the words of Brian in how he received this particular translation of the Bible. What I do know is Mohammed had a download from an angel and he wrote the Quran. Joseph Smith had a similar download and found some, some uh, 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 shields with writing on it and started Mormonism. But I know what I think when I hear things like that. I have a ding, ding, ding and a little alarm bell. I have a ding, ding, ding and an alarm bell. And, and, and I always check myself, is this alarm bell coming from God? Is it just coming from me? Where's the alarm bell? So I even check out the alarm bell. But I have an alarm bell going off. Because you see, the Passion Translation, when it first came and was started, had been written by one man. One man. Not the apostles, not the prophets, not the writers of the original Bible. But the Passion Bible has been written by one man claiming to have the secrets of the Greek and Hebrew languages given to him by Jesus. As soon as I hear anyone saying things like secrets, I start to immediately go occult. The word occult just simply means hidden away. Occult, just no, nothing to be worried or frightened about the word. It means darkness, it means hidden away. So what I hear is, well, that my Bible I've been looking at, the Bible that served us well for two and a half thousand years or whatever, actually isn't good enough. There were secrets that needed to come to be rewritten into the Bible, and this one man has received the download, uh, uh, the keys, and he's received the secrets of the Hebrew language. And so when I hear these things, alarm bell, alarm bell. And that, for me, demands more research. And so, obviously, you know me. I've done a lot 
of research. So it seems to me that the Passion Translation is a reworded and a rewritten Bible by one man. And when it has been read and analyzed, it becomes clear that actually it has some very big differences to our Bible. Number one, it's up to 50% larger. 50% more words in the Passion Translation Bible. That's an awful lot of words that are not in the original Greek and the Hebrew. This itself surely gives massive room for hidden agendas or doctrines or theologies to be propounded and contained within it. It seems to me, as Paul said, in our latter day, in the end times, the closer we get, people will be deceived and they will go on deceiving others. The whole thing about deception, and I've thought a lot about this, the whole thing about deception is you do not know when you are being deceived. And so these things can come from an attitude of I have not been received, it's definitely Jesus who spoke to me, gave me the secrets, and here it is. And so I'm not here to judge people, but I'm certainly here to judge the written the written work that comes out of it. And therefore, I feel it's right to give some form of warning. And so, it seems to me this could be a deception. And the same material, if it were marked just as a commentary, someone's view of the Bible, if it was marked as this is my understanding of it, which is completely different to authorized scripture, then many proper Bible translators say it would be very, very concerning It's not the Bible, and it's not really a good commentary either, so beware. And in fact, I've recently found out that some reputable outlets have stopped selling it. If that isn't enough, one other thing I want to share with you, because it comes from the same origin, it comes from the same attitude, and it raises similar concerns for me, is this. In a television interview, on YouTube, in a television interview, the same person, Brian, I'm not against Brian at all, nice guy, has a wonderful way of speaking, but I am concerned about what is being said, and I'm concerned about any of the experiences that appear to be happening. So in a television interview, the same Brian claims that Jesus took him up in the spirit to the library of heaven. Jesus took him up to the library of heaven. And this uh, slide are screen captures that I took from the actual video testimony he did on an American so-called Christian TV show that I'm worried about anyway. And he stated this, this is what Brian stated. He said that in heaven's library, he saw many books, including cures for cancer. Well, hallelujah, give us those books. Wouldn't that be an amazing thing if those books came from heaven to earth and we could cure all cancers? However, his eyes were transfixed on a particular book titled John chapter 22. Have you ever heard of John chapter 22? Those of you who know your Bibles will know there are only 21 chapters in your Bible in the Gospel of John. And apparently, as Brian goes on to say, these are his words, not my words, Jesus said to Brian, you can't have John chapter 22 yet, as you cannot handle it. You cannot handle it. But Jesus then promised to bring Brian back up into heaven and to give him John chapter 22, to bring John chapter 22 from heaven down to earth at another time in the future to add it to the Bible. Is anyone having a ding, 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 ding here in Soul Church? Is anyone having a ding, 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 ding here in Soul Church? I personally think that we should all be having a ding, ding, ding. But you know, if you are deceived, you don't know you're being deceived. And therefore, there comes a time, as I will go on to, the preachers or teachers should be bringing some of this stuff so that people can check it out and really think about it for themselves. So it's not just the Passion Translation, it's the whole thing that brings concerns to me. And therefore, I felt it was right, given the passage that we're looking at, to Timothy chapter 4, to bring it to you. 
I do not believe that there is a John chapter 22, even if there is a library in heaven to come to earth to add to. I believe the finished work of the canon of scripture is completed. My concern about one person who's bringing these things, it's like saying, Jesus told me, so it's okay then. And all of the people who are listening to this man, they're clapping and they're cheering and they're loving it. But I'm going, ding, ding, ding. What's wrong with these people? What's happened to these people? Is everyone deceived? Or am I deceived because I don't believe this? Is there something wrong with me? Well, I prefer to stick with my Bible that served the church for two and a half thousand years or whatever as the finished work of God. Because as I said, it is the unique word of God. It's founded in history. It's founded in archaeology. Its prophecies are coming true. And the future prophecies, I believe, will come true also. There's a pedigree attached to this. I do not believe, and even Jesus himself said, you cannot add to scripture. Do not give or take away. Even if that's just revelation, you should not be adding to or taking away from scripture. So I'm concerned about one person making these claims. And at some point, I guess, John 22 will be a bestseller in all of the bookstores. So I give you this warning. So I think, no, 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 you cannot add to scripture. What is going on in certain streams of Christianity in the world today? And why does so much of this stuff originate in America? I do not know. I'm going to have to do more research. But what I have noticed is when these things are said, there's a great many number of people who just love to hear it, love to join in, to, in with it, and love to believe it. Have they got itching ears, as we heard Paul saying? There will come a time when people will leave sound doctrine, and they will move to teachers and gather people around them so that they hear what their itching ears want to hear. And I say that all of this needs to be checked out with the original. Needs to be checked out with the original. You don't need another. You don't need an added to, 50% bigger, 20% bigger, or additional books. We stick with the original. It's been good enough. And it's really good enough with what is contained there to help us fight against deception and to help us look into what is happening in the world today, particularly from within the worldwide church. A time is coming when there will be a one world government, there will be a, a one world church, a bit like the Chinese governmental church dictating what happens in the church. But I'm quite happy to be an underground church. I want to be an underground church. I want to be a church sticking with the original. And I want to be a church knowing the original so I can spot or I can have an alarm bell which goes off in me that says, check it out, check it out, check it out. And I have to say, I've been checking things out for 20 years. And I have to say, this sort of stuff brings me to boiling point. And I must admit, I'm seeing more and more and more eminent teachers coming out against all of this stuff. Do you know, we live in a world of Facebook, we live in a world of YouTube. I'm caught up in it like anybody else. We don't just believe everything we see on some charismatic TV program. We don't, we don't just believe any of that. We check it out. And I can say, for me, if there are two key things, there's only two things here. They're very, very big things, mind. It seems to me that I'll just kind of reject all of the stuff that that wing are involved in. Because this is very big and dangerous, in my view, deception. Check it out yourself. Now then, I want to say something about the message. I want to say something about the message. The message, it is popular. The message by Eugene Peterson is a transliteration. Eugene wrote it. He never said it was scripture. It was like a wonderful commentary side to it in contemporary language. It was never sold as a Bible. Eugene Peterson wrote it. He's with the Lord now. And Eugene Peterson is a respected, fully qualified Bible translator, part of the team that translated the NIV and other Bible translations. But even with the message, I've looked up on some, some um, outlets. They're now selling the message. It's a Bible. They're selling this as the Bible. They're giving a false impression. Eugene never intended this to be 
scripture. It is a transliteration. And whilst the message is useful, whilst the message uh, Eugene tried to put in it in contemporary language with a bit more of a rawness of emotion in, into it from, from the Hebrew, and he understood the Hebrew and the Greek himself. But whilst the message is useful, I would not use it as my Bible. I would not use it as, as a studying Bible. I will stick with the original. I may well refer to it to get a different perception, but I would not use it in the same way as Scripture, and Peterson never claimed it was. The message has a fantastic use, and it brought Scripture to, to life in a certain way. But it's not a Bible. Not like the Passion Bible and the way that that is being sold, and I disagree with that. And as I've said, even if it was sold like the message, so many Bible translators have huge problems with it, they would naturally reject it. And I would be concerned about any church that majored on the Passion Translation or indeed the message. Paul said in the last 10 minutes, Paul said to Timothy in verse 2, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, it will be hard out there. Timothy, there will be seasons where the gospel is received and there are seasons where the gospel is rejected. Some will say yes and some will say no. But in season or out of season, you preach the apostles' teaching. You preach the gospel in the original version. At my ordination, you had to choose a Bible passage. And it might say something about me when it comes to what is the truth, what is the truth of Scripture, what's the truth. You know, many might see me over the years of being quite suspicious of new things because I always check it out. I always spend time working out. And I always try to come to a conclusion that's in line with my Bible. But I chose this passage. I had this passage read out about me because that certainly at the time was my heart but it could be preach the truth stick with the truth be careful not to wander off the truth this is the charge that I believe I myself came under and I have tried to do this with my own oppositions, with my own troubles, with my own doubts with my own searching for my own temptations it has been a burdensome charge. There are not many charges in the Bible. Paul charged Timothy in a powerful way. You preach the truth of the gospel in season and out of season. When it's popular, when it's not popular. It's a burdensome charge, but a vital one. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, as he said in chapter 3, a time is coming. And as we know, is already here, it was there with them, when people will not put up with sound doctrine, for they will gather people around them and teach us to say what their itching ears want to hear. What is it that makes me feel good? What is it that, give me the information and I will piece it together and I will make my own Christian faith? A number of people that I've met who make their own Christian faith and they say things to me and I think, well, that doesn't line up with the plumb line of, of the Bible, but it takes a lot of time to work these things through. And listen, none of us are perfect all the time. There are doctrines, there are things that I used to believe, and I realize in my naivety that actually as I've seen more, you have to ditch that when God reveals you to the truth in line with his word, when more understanding comes. We are not born knowing everything correctly. This is a discipleship program. We are set apart and we have to learn and read, read the Bible, learn, understand the doctrines, piece it all together from the original. We study the original. So when something new comes, something new is proposed from anywhere. But a lot of this is coming through the church. We have the plumb line because we are not ignorant. We are not people who just go with any wind of doctrine. We're not people who just go with our feelings. We are people who know the word and we assess the word 
and then we make an assessment and we come back to the Bible. Hallelujah. Am I on my own? I hope I'm not, Salt Church, I hope I'm not on my own. This last year has been quite a, quite a tough year of, of teaching and preaching things that have challenged us and is challenging us to the core. But there is this time that is coming and Paul says it will get worse. In, the, in fact, the whole Bible says it's going to get worse in the end times. Jesus said when he comes back, will there be any faith on the earth? This is a battleground and now it's a battle actually even over the Bible. There's a deceiving coming in my understanding that is even now changing the Bible. Let's get everybody to believe something different. My goodness, no, 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 is what I'm happy to say. We've looked at the Passion Bible and we've looked at Heaven's Library and is there a John 22? There is so much more in this area that could be taught, which I'm aware of. Maybe if people are interested, I might do a, a series of Bible studies on it, but only if you're really interested. Paul said to Timothy, preach in season and out of season. Paul tells Timothy, and through our Bibles, Paul tells you and me, preach in season, preach out of season. If this sermon is out of season, then I think I've grown to say so be it. I would rather fear God than feel the opinions of man. Although I will listen to any opinion. I hope I'm a nice guy. I will debate with you. I will sit down. You know, God in Isaiah, he said, he said, come, let us sit down together. Let us work this thing out. And I'm very, very happy to sit down and work doctrines out. You know me, I love a good doctrinal chat. But we need to, and, we, and there should be more debate in the church about these things. And there really should be to check these things out. I believe that we live in times when, as Paul said, men and women will not put up with sound doctrine, they will change it and they will morph, and the danger of this is morphing into a completely different gospel. Paul said to Timothy, keep your head strong and stay strong. Paul says to Timothy, you will have trouble, and that's true today as it ever was. Paul uses the word discharge. Discharge your ministry, and that means to deliver on every part of the ministry God has given to Timothy. Which means don't hold anything back. Don't hold anything back. The temptation when I look at the Bible and you look at some of the things that the Bible says, all the difficult stuff is to hold back. That is a really tough word, is to hold back. Let's go with the nice stuff. But I can't hold back. And I don't think you would want me to hold back because this is in the Bible. So the whole ministry of the Bible needs to be taught. It is a formidable responsibility, and the heart of a pastor is, and should be, to protect the sheep. Is to protect the church from wolves in sheep's clothing, from deception. Times will be full of attacks, and it's an attack on the truth, an attack on Jesus, who he is really, and an attack on the Bible. The time is here, and it will proliferate. It will grow in the end times, and surely it is here now. Paul knows in this passage, he knows his time is short. He states it's time for his departure. He's in prison, he's in Rome, and he knows that soon he will be beheaded. That's a pretty challenging position, isn't it? Paul lost his head for the gospel and for the truths that he is telling us. But, hallelujah, Paul discharged his ministry. We know that. He wrote so much of the New Testament. Timothy must charge, discharge his ministry, and you and I must discharge our ministry. Paul has endured his hardship. Timothy must endure his own hardship. And this letter of 2 Timothy is Paul's last letter before his death. And what a great last set of words of Paul for us to read. Despite all the hassles, the challenges, the false doctrines that he was fighting against, the perilous men, the perilous times, the pressure to conform, the pressure to hold back on the truth, Paul has overcome all of it. And he makes a number of brilliant statements in this chapter in verse 7. I have fought the good fight. 
You know, we don't actually think of the gospel as a fight, do we? We don't think of the gospel as being in a boxing ring, but actually it is. It's a fight in the world. It's a fight against deception. It's a fight against the enemy. It's a fight against devil, who's behind everything that is false to lead people astray. And Paul says, I have fought the good fight. There's only one good fight. There's only one good spiritual good fight. It's a fight for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And then he overcame in Christ Jesus. Then he says, I finished the race. Poof, I finished the race. He has not gone left or right into other doctrines. He's not fallen into deception. He stayed on his course. He stayed on the track. He has run his race well, and he is going to finish his race in the faith well. As he says next, I have kept the faith. My goodness, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. For Paul to say, I've kept the faith, what does that mean? It's been a battleground for him his whole Christian life from the moment of his Damascus experience when he was blinded by the light of Jesus and the one who persecuted Christians is going to lose his head for the, for the Christians for the sake of the gospel and for this word to come to the Gentiles. And Paul knows that he will receive a crown of righteousness. There's a reward coming, says Paul. There's a reward coming. He can see it coming. And I hope that I can say the same to all of those things. I hope you can say the same when the time comes. And I can think of no better vision for an end. To have run the race, finishing in the faith. Do you know, life is actually quite long. Life is long. It's short, but it's long. There are many who start well in the faithful of fire, but not everybody finishes well, and not everybody finishes in the faith. Many lose their faith along the way. Pastors as well as others. No one is immune. Many fall into deception. Many end up teaching deception, and many lead many astray. It is a real battle. In closing, Paul mentions a number of people by name who hurt him and who left him and also the faith. Jenny pronounced some of those names well. It felt like everybody had deserted Paul except the Lord. And this is what we learned about Paul's faith, didn't we? It wasn't about having everything in this earth, health and wealth and prosperity and a fantastic human life. What we heard from Paul's example is through his struggles, through the strifes, through his thorn in the flesh, through everything that happened to him, he gives this as his, his, uh, his, 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 his pinpoint, his, uh, his pinnacle of what he was looking for. He said, everybody deserted me, but the Lord didn't. And the Lord gave me the strength to endure hardship and to carry on. And here in verse 4, Paul was delivered from the lion's mouth. Hallelujah. And to conclude, I can smell the coffee. <laughs> to conclude, 2 Timothy is Paul's last letter. He wrote it from prison in Rome to his mentee, Timothy. He is about to be beheaded for the faith. It is a deeply powerful and personal letter. Paul is passing on the wisdom of his experience. And he does not sugarcoat the ministry. He warns Timothy of all the dangers. Keep your head. Know your Bible. Stay strong in the faith. Persevere and overcome in the original word of God. Hallelujah. Preach the gospel when people want to hear it and when they don't want to hear it. Whatever happens to you, Timothy, says Paul, God is with you and God will support you in your sufferings. God will see you through all the pain. He will see you through all the disappointments. How disappointing to have a team of co-workers and they all leave you because you, are, because you are in the word of God, preaching the truth of the gospel. Even then, people were going astray. Even then, it was too hard to keep and they were losing their faith some went to Thessalonica. Nothing wrong with Thessalonica. Nice little city. I've kind, of, I've kind of been there on my way to Thesos. 
Uh, anyway, and finally, Paul, through sharing his own life with Timothy, his own life is a great encouragement to Timothy. These men and women of the Bible are a great encouragement to us, aren't they? Boy, did they suffer. Boy, did they make mistakes as well. Boy, they, they really mucked it up. But Paul says, despite who I was, this is who I am now. I fought the good fight, I finished the race, and I have kept the faith. So I say to you, Salt Church, I say to myself, fight well, run the race well, finish in the faith, the one true faith. God will reward you and me. And he will say, well done good and faithful servant. Surely, Soul Church, we strive for the same. Amen. Amen. Master, amen. Th thank you very much. Master, come and lead us in what you, I'm sure will be God's song for us. Amen.